Hello friends and welcome to my channel. In this video, we'll be learning about the anatomy of the diencephalon. To begin with, the diencephalon forms a part of the forebrae. It is a middle structure which is largely embedded inside the cerebrum, as you can see right here. In this diagram, you can see the sagittal cross section of the third ventricle, the fourth ventricle, the cerebral aqueduct, and the structures of the brainstem, that is the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, and here is the cerebellum. After having an understanding of the orientation of these structures, let's look at another diagram. In order to learn about the position or the location of the structures of the diencephalon. In this diagram, you can see the frontal cross section of the structures of the brain. Here you have the pons. So as we had seen in the earlier diagram, above the pons comes the midbrain. So we have the midbrain, pons, and finally beneath it, there's the medulla. So these three structures forms the brainstem. Right here, you can see this is the third ventricle. Here we have the lateral ventricle. The third ventricle is connected to the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct. So here, in order to understand the location of the structures of the diencephalon, right here, on each side of the third ventricle, you can see the presence of the thalamus, that is this structure right here. So thalamus forms a part of the diencephalon. Now coming back to this diagram, you need to imagine that the structures of the diencephalon are present on either side of this third ventricle, like this on the left, and there is another one on the right. There's a left and right parts of the diencephalon. Now here you can see that there is a hypothalamic sulcus that extends from the interventricular foramen to the cerebral aqueduct. And it divides each half of the diencephalon, that is the left half and the right half of the diencephalon, into dorsal and ventral parts. So let's consider the left half of the diencephalon right here, lying on the left side of the third ventricle. So here we have the hypothalamic sulcus and this is the dorsal part and this is the ventral part. So looking at the dorsal part of the diencephalon, we have the thalamus as pointed out right here. Then we have the metathalamus right here and the epithalamus right here. So those are the three parts in the dorsal part of the diencephalon. Now looking at the ventral part, we have the hypothalamus right here and the subthalamus. So here you can see the part of hypothalamus in, in the floor of the third ventricle that is shown right here. So the ventral part of the diencephalon consists of the hypothalamus and the subthalamus. Now, concising the important points that we learned under the introduction to the diencephalon, the diencephalon is a middle structure which is largely embedded in the cerebrum. Its cavity forms the greater part of the third ventricle. The hypothalamic sulcus extending from the interventricular foramen to the central cerebral aqueduct divides each half of the diencephalon into dorsal and ventral parts. Looking at the dorsal part of the diencephalon, we have the thalamus, the metathalamus and the epithalamus. And the ventral part of the diencephalon, we have the hypothalamus and the subthalamus. Now let's learn about the thalamus in detail. Thalamus, as you can see in this diagram, is a large mass of grey matter situated in the lateral wall of the third ventricle. Here you can see the third ventricle and on its lateral wall you can see the presence of the thalamus. Similarly, it is situated in the floor of the central part of the lateral ventricle. Here is the lateral ventricle and here is its central part. And beneath it, you can see that is in the floor of the central part of the lateral ventricle, you can see the presence of the thalamus. Now, let's look at its measurements. Anthroposteriorly, it is 4 centimeters. Vertically, it is again 4 centimeters. And transversely, it is 4 centimeters in length. It has two ends, an anterior and posterior end. And looking at its surfaces, there is a superior surface, an inferior surface, a medial surface and a lateral surface. Now let's look at the right and left thalami from its superior aspect. In its anterior end, we can see the anterior nucleus. 
it is narrow and forms the posterior boundary of the interventricular foramen next we have the posterior end which is expanded and is known as the pulvinar of the thalamus it overhangs the lateral and medial geniculate bodies as you can see right here now let's learn about the superior surface of the thalamus the superior surface is divided into a lateral ventricular part and a medial extraventricular part now the lateral ventricular part as you can see right here forms the floor of the central part of the lateral ventricle as we had learned while looking at the structure and location of the thalamus now looking at the medial extraventricular part it is covered by the tela choroidea of the third ventricle now these structures are limited laterally that is away from the midline laterally by three structures that is mainly the caudate nucleus the stria terminalis and the thalamostriate vein so these are the three structures that you need to remember that the thalamus is bounded laterally by that is the caudate nucleus the stria terminalis and the thalamostriate vein now it is limited medially by a structure called the habenular stria finally looking at the inferior surface of the thalamus it rests on the subthalamus and the hypothalamus as we had learned earlier concising the points that we learned till now the thalamus is a large mass of gray matter situated in the lateral wall of the third ventricle and the floor of the central part of the lateral ventricle its measurements are anteroposteriorly it is 4 cm vertically 4 cm and transversely 4 cm it has two ends anterior and posterior and four surfaces that is the superior inferior medial and lateral surface the anterior end with the anterior nucleus is narrow and forms the posterior boundary of the interventricular foramen the posterior end is expanded and it is known as the pulvinar it overhangs the lateral and medial geniculate bodies The superior surface is divided into a lateral ventricular part and a medial extraventricular part. The lateral ventricular part forms the floor of the central part of the lateral ventricle, while the medial extraventricular part is covered by the tela choroidea of the third ventricle. Now these structures are limited laterally by the caudate nucleus, stria terminalis and thalamostriate vein and medially by the habenular stria. Then we have the inferior surface that rests on the subthalamus and the hypothalamus. Next let's look at the structure and nuclei of the thalamus. First let's look at the white matter. We have an external medullary lamina that covers the lateral surface. Then we have an internal medullary lamina that divides the thalamus into three parts. So here you can see a Y-shaped structure, the internal medullary lamina. that is a part of the white matter of the thalamus it divides the thalamus into three parts that is anterior medial and lateral here also we have anterior medial and lateral so that is about the white matter of the thalamus now looking at the gray matter so for the gray matter we have the anterior nucleus the medial nucleus the lateral part of the thalamus that is the largest also called the neothalamus and finally we have the intralaminar nuclei now let's learn about the gray matter of the thalamus in detail through this diagram so we had learned earlier that the gray matter of the thalamus is divided into the anterior nucleus that you see right here the medial nucleus and the lateral part of the thalamus which is the largest and also called the neothalamus So right here we are going to look at the further divisions of this lateral part of the thalamus. So the lateral part of the thalamus is divided into the lateral nucleus in the dorsolateral part right here and the ventral nucleus in the ventromedial part right here. Now the ventral nucleus is further subdivided into an anterior, intermediate and posterior group. and the posterior group is further subdivided into a medial and lateral group now in the gray matter of the thalamus we also learned about the intralaminar nuclei 
that is present in the white matter of the nucleus right here. Here is the intralamina nuclei. It includes the centromedian nucleus, the midnight nucleus and the reticuli nuclei. So I'll list out the names of the nuclei. The intralamina nuclei will include the centromedian nucleus, the midline nucleus and the reticular nuclei. Now this is another simplified diagram showing the nucleus of the thalamus and its parts. And through this diagram we are going to learn some of the basic simple connections of the thalamus. So right here you can see the anterior nucleus. It receives afferent impulses or the afferents from the mammillary body or the mammillothalamic tract. So we can use this diagram to remember the simple connections. Now for the medial nucleus, it receives afferents from the hypothalamus, the frontal lobe of the cerebrum, the corpus striatum and other thalamic nuclei. Next we have the lateral nuclei, that is the lateral dorsal, the lateral posterior and the pulvinar, as you can see right here. They receive impulses from the precuneus and superior parietal lobule of the cerebrum. Looking at the ventral nuclei, that is first we look at the ventral anterior. This mainly receives afferents from the structure called globus pallidus. As it is drawn right here, it receives afferents from the globus pallidus. Looking at the ventral lateral nucleus right here, it receives afferents from the cerebellum. Then let's look at the ventral postrolateral. It receives impulses from the spinal and medial lemonisci, that is structure number 6 right here. We can see it is a ventral posterior lateral nucleus. It receives impulses from the medial lemoniscus and spinal lemoniscus. Then looking at the ventral postromedial right here, it receives afferents from the trigeminal lemoniscus as it is drawn right here. Then we have the centromedian nucleus. We had learned about it as it is a part of the intralamina nucleus. And it receives efferent impulses from parts of the corpus striatum, the lemonisca and also from the areas 4, 6 of the cerebral cortex. So that is the main structures and the efferent impulses that they receive and their important functions. After having learned about the thalamus, now let's learn about the metathalamus. This diagram shows a transverse cross section at the level of the metathalamus and we are looking at it from an inferior point of view. So the metathalamus consists of medial and lateral geniculate bodies. This is the medial geniculate body and this is the lateral geniculate body. They are situated on each side of the midbrain below the level of the thalamus. Looking at the location of the medial and lateral geniculate body in this diagram, here we have the medial geniculate body, here is the lateral geniculate body, this is the thalamus. So their location lies below the level of the thalamus. Here is the midbrain and here are the remaining structures. So first looking at the medial geniculate body right here, it is an oval elevation situated below the pulvinar. It lies lateral to the superior colliculus as you can see right here, superior and inferior colliculi are parts of the midbrain. So it lies lateral to the superior colliculus. The inferior brachium connects the medial geniculate body to the inferior colliculus. So right here, this is the inferior brachium. Now this particular medial geniculate body has different connections. That is, it has afferent connections and efferent connections. So it has afferents that it receives information from the lateral lemoniscus, from the fibers of both inferior colliculi. It also receives afferents from the ascending reticular pathway. Now talking about the efferents, it gives out acoustic radiation that goes to the auditory area of the cerebral cortex. Then it also gives out efferent fibers to the sec secondary somatosensory area of the cerebral cortex. And its function, that is a function of the medial geniculate body, is that it acts as the last relay station on the pathway of auditory impulses to the cerebral cortex. That is nothing but the entire pathway of hearing, that is auditory pathway, the connections are made and it finally has to reach the cerebral cortex. 
So this particular medial geniculate body acts as the last relay station to send impulses to the cerebral cortex. Next let's look at the lateral geniculate body. This is also a small oval elevation situated anterolateral to the medial geniculate body. It lies below the thalamus and it is overlapped by the medial part of the temporal lobe of the cerebral cortex. It is connected to the superior colliculus by the superior brachia as you can see right here. Again, the lateral geniculate body has certain connections that is afferents and efferents. It receives afferent impulses from the optic tract that is from the visual pathway. It sends out efferent fibers that is it mainly sends out the optic radiation that goes to the visual area of the cerebral cortex. Now the function of the lateral geniculate body is that it is a last relay station on the visual pathway to the occipital cortex. Concising the important points that we learned under the metathalamus, the metathalamus consists of medial and lateral geniculate bodies which are situated on each side of the midbrain below the thalamus. Talking about the medial geniculate body, it is an oval elevation situated just below the pulvinar. It is lateral to the superior colliculus and the inferior brachium connects the medial geniculate body to the inferior colliculus. There are afferent and efferent connections for the medial geniculate body. The afferent connections include the lateral lemniscus fibers from both inferior colliculi and ascending reticular pathway and the efferents include the acoustic radiation going to the auditory area of the cortex and to the secondary somatosensory area. The function of the medial geniculate body is that it acts as the last relay station on the pathway of the auditory impulses to the cerebral cortex. Looking at the lateral geniculate body, it is a small oval elevation situated anterolateral to the medial geniculate body below the thalamus. It is overlapped by the medial part of the temporal lobe and it is connected to the superior colliculus by the superior brachium. The connections are afferents from the optic tract and efferents to the optic radiation going to the visual area of the cortex. And the function of the lateral geniculate body is that it acts as the last relay station on the visual pathway to the occipital cortex. Let's learn about the epithalamus that is a structure right here. The remaining video of the anatomy of the diencephalon can be accessed on my website at a minimal cost. The link to it is given in the description below. I hope you found this video helpful. Thank you for watching.